Now let's look at this question of why an architecture, particularly a software architecture, is important. Uh, first thing is that the architecture is a model of the system. Uh, I better explain, I'm talking about an architecture as if I'm talking about a singular thing. Um, but it's not. It's not as if we have just the one diagram and that's it. We have a collection of diagrams and the architecture can include the initial modeling of the problem uh, through to modeling of the, the eventual solution. And, and gradually as we go through the subject, this is what we'll explore. Now, um, any and all of those are models of the system, models of the problem particularly, uh, allow us to explore the problem. Now this, this I think is extremely important because too frequently um, the problem itself is not, not that well understood and we try to implement a poorly understood problem and the result is a mess. Now this is particularly important with um, uh, more recent systems because uh, more recently the systems that people are trying to implement are not well understood systems. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, the systems that were being implemented were largely already known manual systems and people had a very good understanding of them. But they've all largely been implemented now. We have our ERP systems and our CRM systems and all that sort of stuff. So all the normal things have been done. Now what we're trying to do is to attack problems where we don't have an existing solution. We don't have an analog of this, this particular solution to the thing. And we're trying to develop it. So we need to explore the problem. We need to be able to understand the problem. And that's where the architecture starts to become important because here we have the means to model the problem. And that's what we must do. Second reason for the importance of the architecture is because it, it uh, permits and encourages and supports communication among the stakeholders. Uh, now, not every diagram not every piece of uh, architecture is suitable for all stakeholders, but different parts of the architecture can be used to communicate meaningfully with the different stakeholders, with the, the problem owner, with the developers, uh, with uh, property domain experts, with you know, a, a whole lot of people, um, including you know, those who want to regulate it and those who want to pay for it, stuff like that. Um, the architecture can be used to, to um, uh, discuss um, and communicate among them. It is a boundary object in that sense, a boundary object being something that can be used for communicating um, between diverse groups. Um, they, don't all have, they don't have to understand all of the object, they simply have to see those things that they're interested in in the object. An architecture is also a transferable abstraction of a system. That is, we can design an architecture for a system now, we can implement that system. We can take that same architecture and go away and implement a second system that will not be exactly the same as the first. It'll be a different implementation. So the architecture becomes an abstraction of a system that we can then go and implement multiple times if we want. Architectures do last a long time. They last a very long time. They outlive the programs that make them up. I mean, you can change programs, um, and the programs come and go, uh, but the architecture will just kick on forever. Uh, it's really difficult to change. So it's important to get it right, or as right as you can at the time. But the architecture is limited by the context in which it is developed. And that context does include things like knowledge of the problem, um, our perception of um, different systems have changed over time. I mean, a while ago we, we would implement um, a, uh, an accounting system separate from an HR system, separate from a um, you know, supplies ordering system, uh, purchasing system, things like that. Now the whole lot's wrapped up in, in uh, enterprise um, ERP, Enterprise Resource Package, yeah, ERP systems anyway. And similarly, um, customer relationship management systems are uh, bigger than many keeping, keeping tabs on names and addresses. So 
So our understanding has changed. Uh, our understanding and perception of some some domains have changed, and consequently, the architectures of, of systems have needed to change along with them. However, the other things that uh, do constrain what you're going to do with any architecture at the time are legacy systems and those systems that what you're developing must interface to. It's rare, very rare, you'll get a chance to implement something without considering what else it has to work with. And it will also be constrained by the modeling languages that you're, you have available for your use. Well, I must admit, um, uh, classes and objects are pretty flexible. Architectures do limit what can and can't be done. That is, um, although a system can be quite flexible in the functionality that it can provide, it is limited in things uh, like uh, basic decisions that you might make. How long is the customer number? Um, you know, what, what do you provide for this? How did you set about the uh, security part of the system? How did you interface to the file storage? Um, those kind of decisions do support what can be done, but also limit what can be done or, or define what can't be done with the system. And it's surprising the number of very arbitrary decisions that people who really didn't think about that much in the heat of the battle where you just had to get something done. It's all those little decisions that you didn't consider that eventually will come and trip you up. I have there an example of um, architectural constraints. And this was a real system that um, I didn't have anything to do with. I simply um, went to talk to the person who was uh, gradually migrating it. The, the system is, is wrong to call it a system. It was a collection of uh, programs, uh, small systems that uh, collectively controlled some steel making in uh, a fairly local steel maker. Now these things had all been implemented as small systems, um, spot solutions to specific um, things that wanted to be done um, at the time. They'd all grown up. Uh, but as they were implemented, um, one system that was being implemented would say, oh, I need, I don't know, the time perhaps. Now, there's this other program over here that goes and sorts out what the time is, so I will, I will interface to that program and it can tell me what these things do. Now, by the time I got to see it, and this, this was um, uh, mid-2000s somewhere, um, what had happened is that the hardware on which this system ran was being phased out. So I mean, the, the raft really had been lit. The raft was burning. And, and they, they had to invent a new solution and get off it. So here was this person was trying to disentangle all of these connections that had been just built up over time. And to do so without stopping the system. This thing made steel. And uh, one of the, the um, constraints is that uh, every so often uh, you'd have to empty the blast furnace, you'd have to pour the steel. And if the rest of the um, production line wasn't ready for it, they'd just have to tip it on the ground. And that got very expensive. So he was very proud that in the work that, it, that, that, that they had done so far, they'd never had to tip any steel out on the ground. So it was pretty good. Architectures do determine emergent characteristics of a system. Um, point functionality is usually provided in very specific forms. That you, you, you put it in and it comes out. Okay? It's cause and effect. Whereas the um, behavioral characteristics of a system, things like the security, the modifiability, the performance of it, um, the usability of it, the testability of it, uh, tend to be more an emergent property that is a combination of things that, that, that uh, collaborate and um, produce these effects. Um, and that's one of the things that the architecture does introduce and does constrain. So that's something to be, be uh, dealt with. Now, some of the trade-offs that get made there is that you, you tend to have to favor uh, one thing over another. Now, Highly reliable systems do need a lot of um, backups and checks in them, so they, they, 
not going to be high performance. High performance systems tend to be a little fragile, you know, they will break. Um, highly usable systems are not fast because they have to keep stopping and checking and, and making sure that everything is right. Um, highly secure systems are um, probably difficult to use, difficult to access because, I mean, if you, if you, to get a highly secure system you have to prevent access. If you want a highly accessible system it's not going to be very secure. So the architecture can determine a great deal of those things. So in summary then, architectures last a long time. They are really good for exploring uh, and understanding the problem. Um, they uh, they uh, can assist and aid communication between all the stakeholders and they do determine to a large extent the behavioral characteristics of the system.